Good afternoon. We'll get started here. Good afternoon. I'm Rich Lyons, Dean of the Business School here at Berkeley Haas. Welcome to all of you. This is our highest level Dean's uh, speaker series, as you know. We've had a wonderful and very full agenda here of speakers this, this uh, term. And I just want to give you a couple uh, other ones that are coming up next. So next week, we have the Defense Minister of Germany, Minister Ursula von der Leyen. She is the first female Minister of Defense that Germany has ever had. She's an absolutely uh, remarkable world leader. Uh, that's Thursday, March 10th, in here of the Wells Fargo Room. Uh, we also have next month, this is Scott Galloway, MBA 92. So Scott was a co-founder of Profit Brand Consulting. He's, just, he's really just a, pro, a branding genius. Uh, done a lot of work with our own Dave Ocker. Some of, many of you know Dave. Uh, serial entrepreneur. His current company is called L2. It's all about luxury brands and sort of understanding what's a luxury brand, how is the luxury marketplace moving. He's also a marketing professor in NYU Stern. So he's, he's in New York. He's, he's served on our advisory board of the Haas School. That's April 13 at 1230. Scott will be here. Today, I am so pleased to welcome Danae Ringelman here. Danae is a friend of the school. She is a friend to me and to many of us in this room. And it is, uh, it is what, what she and her co-founders have achieved is, is just remarkable. I'll say a bit about that, and we'll, of course, hear most of that uh, directly uh, from her. She is a graduate of our full-time MBA program. She is as true an exemplar of our defining principles as you will ever find uh, when we think of sort of Questioning the status quo, she left a lucrative career on Wall Street to pursue her dream, and in her words, she left finance to change finance, and that's really what Indiegogo has been all about. In 2006, she came to Haas to pursue her MBA, and while here, she joined forces with Eric Schell and Slava Rubin, who would eventually become her co-founders at Indiegogo. She and her partners started working on Indiegogo as MBA students. Uh, their mission was to democratize access to funding. Uh, after being turned down by over 90 uh, venture capital firms, uh, or at least venture capital asks, I mean, Indiegogo was launched in 2008, which wasn't an easy year to launch anything. Danae's perseverance and efforts helped propel Indiegogo into the world's largest and oldest crowdfunding site. It has hundreds of thousands of individuals, entrepreneurs, businesses, and nonprofits, and it has given them access to capital as they, the capital that they need to make their, their dreams a reality. Fundraising campaigns have been launched in countries around the world, millions of dollars being distributed every week due to the contributions made by this Indiegogo community. Her well-earned recognition includes being named as one of Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40, as well as San Francisco Business Times' 40 Under 40 in 2014. Fast Company included her in its top 50 women innovators in technology. That was 2011. This past fall, it was my honor to present to Danae, along with her Indiegogo partner, Eric, um, the Haas Leading Through Innovation Award. This is an award that we give every year at our gala to an alum who has just made extraordinary change in whatever industry that they are in. And they were wonderful winners of that, event, that, uh, that award. It's a privilege to have her here today. Her thoughts on topic today, intentionality of entrepreneurship. She has much to share. Join me in welcoming our own Danae Ringelman. All right. It's really, it's super, super awesome to be back. I remember I was trying to decide which business school to go to, and I was in this room, um, and I think it was um, one of the alumni standing up here on a panel talking about how he knew he was in the right place um, when he came to Haas, because when he got here, um, all he felt were people who wanted to make change. They were just trying to, whatever problem they were trying to solve, they were trying to, you know, turn a right or wrong into a right. And like, I think that was the moment that I'm like, I need to be here. Um, I need to be in this environment in order to get this idea off the ground. So I'm super happy to be back here because without Haas, this and everything I'm going to talk about would have been possible. So, um, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the Girl Scouts of Western Washington. Um, a few months ago, they, we all know the Girl Scouts. We all love the Girl Scouts. Go buy their cookies right now. It's a great uh, uh, way to inspire young girls to go into entrepreneurship. 
But um, about a few months ago, they had something extraordinary happen. They had a donor give them $100,000. And this was a small uh, group in Western Washington, which with $100,000, they could do a ton. They could do programs. They could get so many more girls into the program. The only problem with the donation is that that donor said, the only, the only thing you can't do is you can't give this money to transgender girls. And with that, they said, well, that's not in alignment with our mission. So here you go. Thanks for the $100,000. We don't want it. But it was really hard because they knew the, that power of that $100,000 and what it could do. So instead, they turned to Indiegogo. They ended up raising over $300,000 and turning that challenge into an opportunity. Then there's Conscious Period, which are two young women out of LA who, um, in doing their own research, discovered that the, that the feminine product industry, the US government, doesn't actually require feminine product manufacturers to disclose the ingredients in their products. And that was just shock to them because this is, these are products that go, kind of go closest to the, one of the most sensitive part of our women's bodies. Um, and at the same time, they also discovered in working with homeless women in, in LA that one of the biggest problems they face, the biggest cha challenges they face is access to feminine products. I, don't, I know we probably all don't think about that. Um, but rather than just sit and be pissed off about these two problems, they decided to t tackle these two problems together and turn it into an opportunity. And they launched a company called Conscious Period, which makes sustainable, eco-friendly, healthy, non-toxic feminine products with the Tom's Shoes model. With Every time you, you buy a box of tampons, you give one away to a homeless woman in need. And then there is this woman who, we all saw that picture go around the globe a few months ago about the young two-year-old who washed ashore with his face in the sand, trying to flee Syria with his parents. And this woman, um, there was a, not this woman in the picture, but there was a woman when she saw that she just felt completely helpless. Totally, she was a mom, she had a young kids, and she couldn't imagine what those parents were going through. But rather than sit in her emotion and be frustrated about not doing anything and feeling like she couldn't do anything, she actually asked herself, well, can I? And when she was looking at other images of, of the refugees fleeing Syria, what she saw were troves and troves of families, people walking, you know, tens, twenty, dozens, hundreds of miles carrying their children. And that's what gave her the idea. That's what she could do. She, so she started an Indiegogo campaign. She ended up raising over almost $160,000. She was just trying to raise $2,500, enough to pay to send 100 baby carriers over to Syria to give 100 families. And now she's helped thousands. And then these guys, I've always loved these guys. <laughs> this was an entrepreneur, uh, husband and wife team who uh, live up in Utah and are just as perturbed about everything going on in the environment as so, so many of us in this room. But rather than just sit and be like, there's nothing we can do about it, they said, let's, let's, let's tackle this challenge head on. Let's create solar roadways and make all our roads safer, make it solar powered, enough creating energy enough to power our cities, and at the same time reducing carbon, emission, carbon emissions in America and the world by 80%. Yes, it's a massive endeavor, but all massive, massive endeavors have to start somewhere. So they went to Indiegogo to, to raise a million dollars to prototype their idea and get it off the ground and clearly went viral around the world. They raised over $2 million and they're now at the White House and everyone's trying to use their technology and they're on their way to actually making the impact. So what is the, what connects and unites these four different examples? Um, the Girl Scouts of Western Washington, the menstrual revolutionists, as they call themselves, the uh, baby carrier activists and the environmental activists, it's that they're all entrepreneurs. At their core, they're people trying to make a difference. What, what I believe entrepreneurship is, it's not the high-tech Silicon Valley stuff that we like to define it as. Entrepreneurship simply is the art of taking an idea that doesn't yet exist and making it happen. It's seeing what change is needed in the world and having the gumption and the belief and the courage to go make that, make that idea a reality, make that change actually happen. Um, and so, my name's Danae. <laughs> um, you guys know I started with two amazing co-founders, a company called Indiegogo, and that's what I believe um, we're in the business of. Our mission is to, act, is to enable access to entrepreneurship to everyone. Make everyone an entrepreneur, unleash that in inner entrepreneur. And what that means is we're in the business of helping people see what change is needed in the world and then actually making it happen.
And it is working. We're almost at, to, at a billion dollars now in funds raised and distributed. Every country, um, hundreds of thousands of people raising money, millions don't, you know, contributing to things. It's starting to really work. But the reason, which is great, it, you, know, you need that growth to actually prove that you're charging towards your mission. But I think the reason why it's actually it's fun and exciting to be working at Indiegogo because of all that growth, but why I feel like so many people feel what we're doing is so profound and why it's actually an honor to be working at Indiegogo is something is that we're doing a lot more than just moving millions of dollars around every single week. Um, this is a quote that um, has, has stuck with me since I read it. A friend turned me on to this book called uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, there's probably some of you on the audience who are constantly asking, what is the meaning of life? Um, it's a constant search. Keep going. Um, I'm still on it. But um, in the process, I discovered Viktor Frankl, and he's a man who survived the Holocaust and had the ability to see his situation for what it was, um, to not necessarily blame the people involved, but to see the factors that all came together to create such an atrocity and not feel... Um, completely lost and angry about it. And he said, you know, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And what I think he's really done a good job here is he's not necessarily trying to tell us what the meaning of life is, but I think what he's trying to suggest is that we can all find a, a lot of meaning in life if we acknowledge that we are in control of how we respond to the world. We can choose the life of reaction where, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic and you yell back and give them a finger, or you can see your emotion coming at you and you can accept it and decide how you want to act given that emotion. And, you know, some people talk about mindfulness, some people talk about self-awareness, but I think in the process of just seeing how life is poking at you, you, if you just see that and know that you actually have the capacity to decide how you respond to it, um, it's the most empowering thing that can ever happen. And a ton of, you find meaning in the world, you find growth in the world in actually acknowledging that. And so when I think about what we're doing with Indiegogo, which is helping people acknowledge the change they want to see in the world and then do something about it, what we're actually doing is helping people find more meaning in their lives. Um, because starting something, solving a problem, trying to change something is potentially one of the most intentional things you can do. It's the exact opposite of just reacting to the world, but it is the act. All you know, the menstrual revolutionists are trying to not just complain about what is, but actually do something productive for the world and make it better so that it's not a problem going forward. And I do think um, Indiegogo itself is, it's provided a ton of meaning for me as someone trying to bring Indiegogo into the world and see where it needs to go. But the story of it is exactly what I was just talking about, is about acknowledging this space. So for me, many of you maybe have heard the story, but um, I've shared it a lot, and I can't really change it because it's what happened. But um, I was working in Wall Street, and um, short, short story is I got tied up. Uh, I got roped into this event called Where Hollywood Meets Wall Street. There, I was expecting to see power brokers of Hollywood talk to, talking to the power brokers of Wall Street, and I wanted to be a fly on the wall and just really understand what they talked about because I was an investment banking analyst right out of college. All I did was crunch numbers and hang out in my cubicle. So I thought this would be an eye-opening experience, and I got there, and the exact opposite happened. Um, it was not the power brokers of these two industries. It was a sea of emerging artists all hoping to meet their next angel, and because I was one of the five people from a bank who decided to show up, everybody wanted to talk to me. Um, but it was two days later when I got a script FedEx to me from a ver an elderly filmmaker who'd been telling stories his whole life, with a note that said, it was wonderful to meet you. Um, I look forward to financing my next film. And that's when my heart sank, because here was a man with a lifetime of experience who had um, told stories his whole life, yet he was begging me, someone with zero experience, <laughs> for money just because I worked at a bank. And so um, 
I like to say I did what every young girl does when you're totally upset and emotional, <laughs> you call your mom. Um, and I did, and I was tears flowing, America's not a land of all possibilities, we, we're selling a fallacy, it's not the American dream, it's, that's all BS, like the whole thing. I was 22, so know that. Um, and so my mom goes, well, she's running her small business, busy with my dad. She doesn't have time for this. She's like, if, that you're, if you're that pissed off about it, just go do something about it. And she hung up on me. And so <laughs> she forced that space <laughs> between stimulus and response. And it made me realize I was just sitting there complaining, like crying, lost in my own emotions, being whipped around like I had no control. And she forced that space on me, and it, she forced me to realize I can do something about this. I can actually sit here and complain, or I can start to chip away at this problem if it's really that important to me. Um, so I did. I started working with the theater, one of the theater producers I had met at that event um, to put on a play, Arthur Miller, uh, an Arthur Miller play called Incident at Vichy, which is a play about racial profiling during the Holocaust. But this was right after September 11th in New York City, so I thought it was a very relevant theme. Um, the whole goal of, the, of this effort was to stage a one-night production. This is the way theater got produced back then. You'd stay this, stage this one-night production, you'd get in a theater, pack it with an audience, get actors to volunteer their time to read the play, and then get um, investors there to sit in the audience to witness the response, be totally impressed, and be like, yes, I want to invest, and let's do this. Um, everything went perfect except that last little bit <laughs> where the investors that I had hustled my butt off to get into the room um, said that was wonderful. I loved it personally, but not our cup of tea. Good luck. And it was dead. Like all that effort went to nothing. And that was when I realized that while the, you know, my parents who had struggled for 30 years running their small business and this filmmaker, elderly filmmaker that I had met had kind of taught me that finance was really broken. It was this experience that taught me how it was broken and that the reason why um, people suffer so much in getting their ideas off the ground is because the people who want these ideas to happen, which are the, you know, in the place situation, the actors and the audience, they actually didn't have the mechanism to actually make it happen and to fund it themselves. And that was kind of the, the bright light, like, that's what we need to go do. That's how we're going to fix this. So then came here, <laughs> um, a lot of iterations, a lot of poking holes. Um, met my co-founder Eric and, and Slava, his good friend, came in. I actually remember pitching it for the very first time at the end of my first semester to a panel of VCs in my social entrepreneurship class. And um, Priya Haji was one of the judges. And she said, uh, we got a lot of good feedback, a lot of things that were never going to work. <laughs> but she said, you know, there's a ton of holes in this, but you're on to something and you have to see this through. And that was the... Um, motivation I needed to hear to like go. So here we are today. Um, a lot of those holes that people pointed out, um, a lot of the questions we got, the skepticism we got is why would anybody fund something on Indiegogo if they, if they can't get a profit return? My original vision was more of an offline film fund or media fund with a democratic twist. And when I met my co-founders, they convinced me that the internet is a better way to use, <laughs> to raise money, or to use, uh, to raise money and democratize access to capital. We got into a bit of a debate there because I told them about the SEC laws from the 30s, <laughs> which would make it illegal. But together we figured out how, how do we, can we get around those and um, how can we actually make this work? And that's when we said, let's not try to do, uh, give people an opportunity to invest. Let's just prove that the internet is a great mechanism and that's when we came up with the perks concept and we told ourselves let's revisit investment in equity you know 10 years from now so we got a lot of skepticism we had a lot of people saying why would this ever work um, but we came up with the perks and it started to work it was very slow going that financial crash thing didn't really help <laughs> very much a year goes by another year goes by and then suddenly something happened and i don't know if you all recall but there was this campaign that came out of nowhere on Indiegogo. There was a woman who had been bullied on a bus. Uh, she was a bus monitor and it had gotten caught on the internet, some, uh, caught on video and it got put up on the internet and it went viral. And so a guy in Canada saw this video and saw the atrocity of it and how horrific it was. And again, rather than do some, rather than just sit there and be upset, he decided to do something. So he said, you know what, I don't know this woman, but she deserves a vacation because this is hell. 
Um, she deserves at least that. And so this guy, Max, went on Indiegogo to put up a campaign to raise $5,000 to send this woman on vacation. And two weeks or three weeks later, over $700,000 had been raised. And what was fascinating about it is not one perk was claimed, because there weren't perks on it. And we're like, what is going on? We thought the whole reason Indiegogo was working was this perk thing. So we then to start asking ourselves, what is actually happening here? Um, and we realized that there's actually three other motivations that we were had unlocked by creating Indiegogo that we weren't even cognizant and aware of ourselves. And that was that when people were funding things on Indiegogo, whether they had perks or not, these four motivations, these other three motivations were also at play. And the motivations were people, people wanted to support actual people, um, passion, people wanted to, we were passionate about the project for whatever it was. And then people wanted to participate. Maybe they couldn't quit their day job to go make a film, but they can certainly fund one and go volunteer for a day um, and be part of the filmmaking process that way. And so what had happened um, was that we discovered that um, there was all these other motivations. It wasn't just perk and that, you know, while people had been second guessing us because why would it ever work if people couldn't get a return, what we were proving is like it's working because it's not just the return that they actually wanted. And in fact, before Indiegogo came along, all these motivations never had a place to go. All these people, we didn't have the, a way to actually act on things that were true to us. Um, and so when we actually look at some of the most amazing campaigns on Indiegogo, it's the ones that actually hit on all of these motivations. It's the Miss Possibles of the world, which is started by two young undergrads <laughs> who were STEM. They were engineers, and they were so pissed at, off about how there were so few women coming up behind them interested in science and technology that they just took, again, the problem in their own hands and started a company creating dolls for young girls modeled after famous female scientists. That was their way to get girls inspired. This was Marie Curie. That was their first doll that they launched with. Same thing with Kite Patch. This is a University of California alum. Um, they saw the problem of mosquito-borne illness rampant all across the world. And while mosquito nets were great, they were still expensive, hard to deploy, blah, blah, blah. They, had to, they thought there had to be a better way. And so they developed the kite patch, which is just a patch that you put on your arm and it kind of emits this odor. It makes you invisible to mosquitoes, which is phenomenal. Why did people invest in Miss Possible and kite patch? It's because they didn't just want the perk. It's great. I just got my Marie Curie doll. It's very cute. <laughs> but they wanted to be part of the solution. They wanted to help these entrepreneurs who are really passionate about solving this problem. They wanted to um, solve this problem. They were passionate about the problem, and they wanted to be part of it. They didn't want to be sitting on the sideline as complainers. They wanted to be part of the solution, and Indiegogo enabled them to do that. Same thing with the Flow Hive, which I think has been one of the most crazy <laughs> examples of people wanting to <laughs> be part of something. Um, these guys, father-son team out of Australia, just worked for 10 years. They knew there was a better way to do beekeeping, a way to tr treat bees more gently, um, and a way to get more people into the beekeeping experience because we all know that if we don't take care of our bees, our environment is not going to take care of us. Um, and so to, they didn't let the fact that it was just a father-son team out of Australia stop them. They worked away. They found this, this solve, and then they put it out to the world because this is again, a solution for the world, and clearly the world answered. And again, it's not just to get the beehive. <laughs> it's, again, it's to fight our planet. It's to be part of helping us save our planet and not just sit there and gripe about how everybody else is hurting our planet. So in this process, um, you know, my mom gave me the opportunity to be intentional <laughs> about how I was going to respond to this. And in that response came this desire to, to to truly make it entrepreneurship accessible to all, where success of entrepreneurship is not dependent on who you know or how lucky you are, but just dependent on how hard you're willing to work and if you have an idea that truly resonates with the world and is needed in the world. Whether that's big or small, local or global, doesn't matter. Bigger's not better at Indiegogo. Like, doing what, getting the money you need to get going is what's important, um, whatever that is. But in this process of doing this and kind of following our gut and just trying to be as intentional as we can about solving this problem, we actually have un learned a whole ton about what's actually needed in the world. And that was that an op people wanted a way to not just fund for 
uh, for profit, but to fund for purpose. Um, and that is a huge need that was going completely unmet that we actually didn't even see. Um, and so, and that's actually why I don't think when people, everyone's like, are you doing equity crowdfunding? Are you not doing equity crowdfunding? What's, what's your thing? I mean, in a way, that's our original vision was some form of equity crowdfunding. We were part of the whole Jobs Act. I actually did an Indiegogo campaign on Indiegogo back in 2010 <laughs> to raise money. I partnered up with a blogger and a lawyer to raise $1,000 to pay a lawyer to write a petition to the SEC <laughs> to change the laws so that regular Main Street folks can invest in things which according to laws from the 30s, which were put in place to protect people, as they were well-intentioned to do, which I think is a good thing, what they did back then is the way you protected people from losing all your, their money is to not allow them to and lock them out. And therefore, the last 80 years has been a growing divide between the wealth and the unwealthy. Um, and the main street has been locked out of the investing world. And so I think equity crowdfunding is changing that, but I also don't think it's just going to become another Silicon Valley online. Everyone's chasing the next Facebook, and it's because of these other motivations. I actually think we're unlocking a whole new kind of um, sector of funders where purpose is just as important as profit. And we talk about it kind of in the um, uh, we talk about it kind of in the social innovation space or the social entrepreneurship space, but I honestly think as we continue to grow and move in this direction, kind of the only way to do entrepreneurship will be the social entrepreneurship way. Um, because it, based on what people want, they don't just want profit, they actually want to make sure that where they're putting their money is, is making a difference, is aligned to their values. A moment that really kind of summed this all up for me was when I was talking to my mom. My father um, had passed away about a year into Indiegogo, and it was hard for us to keep going, but um, as I'm sure there are people in this room who've lost someone very close, but um, he had done one thing smart. It was, it was a total surprise, but he had, about a, a few months prior to this, it was a total shock, he had actually opened up a life insurance policy, and so my mom suddenly had a little bit of money um, to think about. And so I was talking to her about, like, look, Mom, we got to help you retire. I put on my, like, daughter financial planner hat. <laughs> I was like, let's, we got to put some money in the market. We got to like give you enough money so you can live off um, for the rest of your life. And so I said, why don't we put some money in the market? Because we need to grow this a little bit. And she looked at me. She's like, are you insane? Like, did you just see what happened in 2008? <laughs> why would I give my money to people I don't know working in ivory towers that I can't see investing in companies that I don't even know or care about or even agree with? <laughs> are you insane? And I was like, oh, that's a good point. Um, she's like, can I just invest in you? She's like, I know you. I, I trust you. You're my daughter. I believe in Indiegogo. I think what you're doing is really cool. Um, you have a lot of work to do, but <laughs> it's really cool. And I'd rather, be, I'd rather make money off of that working than make money off of you know, XYZ stock that might be hurting the world. Um, and so to me, I was like, wow, she has never had a place to actually put her money where all of those needs are met. And so that's where I think equity crowdfunding could really go and do really wonderful things for. And that's why it's also I think it's never been a better time to be a social innovator. Um, someone who's thinking about solving problems, building real businesses with real products, but also doing it in a way where it's actually solving really important problems um, that the world needs solved. So I was going to go into another section on lessons learned, but I want to give enough time here for people to ask questions. And I can bring these up as needed if, if people are curious. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Oh, and I bought it. Oh, and I, I guess I should say, sorry, like, that's, I guess, my call to action. If there's someone out there in the audience who, is there a problem that's bugging you, you're upset about it, take that emotion and turn it into something because entrepreneurship could be an incredible path to solving that problem or dealing with that issue. And I think in doing that, you actually might unlock a very meaningful life for yourself. 
So thanks. Thank you, Denae. Thank you. And we have uh, you know, the, the usual microphones for the questions. We're capturing it on video, so we would like you to use the microphone. I'm not going to use the microphone because I have one here, but you don't. Um, I'm going to start off with the first question, but please uh, come up to the microphone if you have a question. One of the many wonderful core values you, you've instilled uh, with your team at Indiegogo is fearlessness. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about how you arrived at that core value and why you think it's so important to your business? Sure. Let me jump ahead. Um, yeah, so back in the day when um, we had the, finally we were able to raise our first one and a half million dollars um, um, in 2011. So that was about three and a half years or so after we intended to raise some money. Um, we had the opportunity to hire people for the very first time. And while we knew what we needed them to do, because we were both all like crazy busy and <laughs> way too much on our plate, um, I had a little bit of a freak out moment. I was like, whoa, but we, don't, we know what we need them to do, but we don't know how we need them to be. <laughs> like, and the three of us have been working together for so long that we almost had no kind of awareness of what it is that we were, like we valued or what we brought every day. And so we, um, set out to kind of define what is it that matters to us. And so we did this exercise where I um, basically, oops, that's it. Um, I basically sat my co-founders and I down. And in five minutes, I said, draw six pictures that answer the question, I love coming to work at Indiegogo because, fill in the blank. And I didn't know where this was going. I just knew it was going to go somewhere which is really frustrating for my co-founder Slava because he always wants to know exactly the objective and goal of everything that we're doing. And I'm like, gotta go with me for this. So it was kind of funny. Um, again, we're very different, but that's why we needed each other. Um, but the point is, is that what we actually realized is that we came to work for the same four reasons and, and we kind of discussed them and discussed them. And in our discussion, kind of four words fell out of it. And those words were fearlessness, authenticity, collaboration, and empowerment. And fearlessness for us meant we all were pumped about coming to Indiegogo because we wanted to change an industry that needed to be changed. It was like totally holding people down. Ideas were going unborn every day, not for fair reasons, but for totally unfair reasons. And so we wanted to change that. Authenticity was we wanted to bring our whole selves to work. We didn't have to put on a, a real or a metaphysical uniform. Collaboration is we just were team players. Like all of us were team sports people. None of us liked doing solo sports. It just was in our nature to like want to work with other people. It's more fun that way to like build something together than to win alone. And then empowerment was we all just wanted to like help people that wanted to be helped. Like you spend a lot of time at work. <laughs> Better make that time based on doing something meaningful, you know, which for us was helping people that wanted to be helped. Um, and so fearlessness, though, uh, today, it's, it, so what happened is that it ended up becoming our values. We didn't even like, it's not like I said, let's go do our values exercise. It kind of happened. Um, but it happened in very organic fashion, which I think is what was so great about it. And today, fearlessness is still one of our values. And we're now doing work around actually articulating what are the behaviors that must be embodied every day to really shine, to showcase that. Because um, we believe that while you need a diversity of experience, diversity, diversity of like thought, skill set, backgrounds, all that stuff, especially when you're in a company that's innovating, especially when you're not trying to do a better, faster, cheaper version of something, but when you're trying to create a whole new way of doing something, there's no blueprint to follow. So you need as diverse a group of people there to kind of question each other um, and figure out what's needed. Um, but what you don't want a diversity on is your values and what's important to everybody every day and how you behave. And so we did the work to kind of go a step deeper and define what does actually fearlessness mean a couple years ago. And what came out of it were very specific behaviors, which were turns challenges into opportunities. When pe we know a person who will work in Indiegogo, who will like thrive in Indiegogo, is someone who when they hit a road bump, they get excited. It means an opportunity to like figure something out because that's essentially what Indiegogo is. Um, it's not someone who gets discouraged and has all these reasons for why something couldn't work. It's something that they're the right type of person in Indiegogo gets ignited, gets excited by that. It, fearlessness also means someone who you know challenges the status quo, which is interesting because that was a <laughs> totally came out of our team, and then suggests new approaches. It's not just someone who sits there and just complains about stuff. <laughs> 
but then says, well, what about this? What about this? Let's try this. Um, because that's what we've needed to figure things out. Like, we, again, have no blueprint. We have no answers. We have to kind of keep trying stuff. And so, and for me, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up all night. Like, I have amazing, we have amazing team leaders now who are excellent managers, excellent at empowering people and living our values and all this kind of stuff. But making sure that this feels real and this is not just words on the wall, but this is, these are enabling factors when people feel like if they do more of this, they'll be more successful and they'll be more themselves at Indiegogo. That to me is what's, our, what's my kind of priority um, right now. Silence. I answered all the questions. That always feels good. Hi. Um, I noticed that one of your slides said abuse, and I'm just curious. Can you yeah. talk? Can you go to it? I'll go back. Yes. Um, but this is my point. Don't make culture 11th on your top 10 list. It'll never, it, it will happen. It just won't happen intentionally. Um, we were having a conversation earlier that culture is the values and behaviors that people embody every day. And if you're not conscious about what those need to be, you're going to hire the wrong people. You're going to hire people that don't necessarily embody what you need them to do. You're going to try to force them to change. That's not going to work. <laughs> And uh, you'll end up spending more time trying to figure out how to work together than actually just getting work done and going. So abuse is, um, I'll go back. One of the lessons learned is that when you're trying to, when you're doing anything, trying to solve a problem, trying to you know, make change, which is what entrepreneurship is, go into it knowing that you're gonna face resistance. If you aren't gonna face resistance, then the change won't be needed. <laughs> and it comes in all flavors. Rejection, huge flavor. We got rejected 90 times. I think the fortunate situation we were in is we were in the business of democratizing capital, so with every rejection came more fuel to succeed. So we're like, this is why it's broken. Um, but it's also why it took a little longer, so we had to be more patient. Um, it also comes in the form of ridicule. Uh, why would anybody fund something if there's no return? So we had to kind of hear that, but like put that aside and just test reality to see if that assumption was true, and it wasn't, is what we found. And it comes in abuse whenever, like for us at our core, core is open. Like we believe in open more than anything. The reason why the gatekeeping system wasn't working was because people, individuals were picking and choosing which ideas had a chance to, to thrive. And as a result, ideas weren't getting through. And there were probably a lot of, there was a lot of bias in, involved in those decisions. It's why you look at the venture capital world and I don't know, less than 10% are run of venture back companies are run by women. On Indiegogo, almost 50% of campaigns are run by women. So it's not like women are less entrepreneurial than men. So there's something going on there, and probably bias has, has a lot to do with it. But so for us, when we launched Indiegogo, the rule, one of the rules that like became, were principles that almost became a rule was like, regardless of what happens, we can't ever lose our open our inclusiveness, which means we don't judge, we don't have an application system. We've had a lot of competition ar arrive around us that brought that system, but for us, going there would be, A, the easy route, <laughs> because um, being open is hard, and it was also um, completely against what we believed in. We did not want to become the gatekeeper in our process of trying to remove the gatekeeping system. Um, there's all these psychological studies when you put people in a room and you automatically give one more power than the other. By the end of the exercise, that person who had just been given more power, there's all these kind of, I'm sure you guys do it in leadership class, there's all these kind of sh data that shows that people who are just happen to be given that power early believe they deserve that power, <laughs> even if it's a silly exercise. So there's all that kind of stuff. Like we did not want to go there. Like we had to stay open. It just means there's lots of campaigns that, you know, um, when you saw them, you're like, wow, they're going to have to work really hard <laughs> to be successful, but that's why education and empowerment is important to us. And yes, then there's always the good ones, like the big ones that are like the flow hives and stuff like that. But for us, it's been very important to say that like bigger is not necessarily better. And we've had so many people who try Indiegogo and fail completely at raising money. And that to them has been the most important lesson they've learned is because they actually realized that their idea wasn't nearly as good as they thought it was. <laughs> or they didn't have an audience, and we just saved them like all their life hmm. savings and three years of their life pouring into something that wasn't gonna see the light of day. 
And so that's when we look at success. We look at, we don't do funding success. We look at um, ideas, like how many people are getting a shot. Um, we had actually a UC Berkeley campaign, uh, two undergrads here came up with this really funky idea to create cat earphones. I don't know if you guys have heard of these. <laughs> Um, she was just one of the, she was just doodling away one day. She's like, she loves to dance with her friends, but she loves to listen to earphones. She's like, why can't I have earphones that like with the push of a button, I go from listening to music myself to like blasting it out to my friends so I can dance with it. So she developed these cat earphones where the music comes out of the cat ears. Totally random. You're like, huh? <laughs> but she goes on, Indi she and her partner here at Berkeley go on Indiegogo to give it a go. And $3 million later, <laughs> there's clearly a market for cat earphones. Um, <laughs> and we go to one of our venture investors and, um, and one of our venture investors and says, like, would you have ever given $3 million to this new startup with literally a napkin drawn of cat earphones? And they literally said, no expletive way. Like, they would never invest in these two young entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs who had, didn't have any entrepreneurship ex experience. They were still figuring out their manufacturing plan. Anyways, long story short, we're, we're doing a lot, like Indiegogo's next chapter is all about, because we're about enabling entrepreneurship, we're about helping every step of the way. And funding is a huge piece of it, but there's other challenges that we're kind of now chipping away with one at, at a time. So we're starting to do retail partnerships, starting to do manufacturing stuff to help entrepreneurs every step of the way so that they don't need to be these like, super connected people in China to go get the thing made or the super connected person in here to go get partnerships. So those, those cat earphones are now, were the best sellers at Brookstone this past thing. And they literally went from idea to reality in Brookstone being one of the hottest sellers within two years because of, of Indiegogo. But the last thing I'll say about abuse, <laughs> come back to this, is the other resistance we met was when you're open, one of the things that's hard about it is people try to take advantage of the platform in the way it wasn't intended. So fraudsters, stuff like that. But what that did is it forced us to innovate. We have trust and safety algorithms similar to what PayPal had to do to be online that now like, are completely revolutionizing the industry and it's allowing us to be completely open so that every little guy has the same shot as every big guy. So I won't leave it on abuse. So if that's another one, that's another big resistance. You will question yourself more than you'd like to admit. <laughs> but just keep going. Hey, thank you so much for your time. You said that you started in Indiegogo because something bothered you, and I was wondering what is bothering you right now? So what is the next uh, thing that you're going to change? <laughs> and maybe more explicit, which headline would you like to read next year about the world, and maybe with regard to Indiegogo? That's, thanks for the easy questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> first question is what's bothering me now? Um, Well, I, I don't know if it's like massively bothering me, but well, it's, it's, yeah, it's irritating me. Um, I think, I think how, how the word entrepreneurship, where are you? Here, sorry. How the word entrepreneurship is defined, I think, needs to be completely rebranded, if that makes sense. Like, right now when you ask people across the world what's an entrepreneur, even when you go to Europe or Africa or whatever, people think they have to come to Silicon Valley to like be successful. And they also think that they have to be a high-tech, you know, VC-backable idea to, to qualify as being an entrepreneur. And I think that's, A, a load of, that's totally wrong. Like. There's, <laughs> I think there's an entrepreneur in all of us. I think it's the part of you that like, again, gets irritated by a problem and wants to solve it. Or, um, you know, something happens to you and you're like, dude, this totally could work better. Like, why is it like this way? And I think what our culture has not done a good job of is like saying, hey, when you're irritated, that's an opportunity. <laughs> you know, go do something about it, right? And I think entrepreneurs are people that like throw events to bring people together. They're people like the baby carrier. She didn't say like, I want to go start a nonprofit, blah, blah, blah. She's like, no, these families need baby carriers. Like that's one thing I can do. No, I can't create world peace and like end the 
genocide going on in the world or the this crazy war that's happening, but I can at least make these this journey for these families easier. So like when people realize that's what like that's all being entrepreneurship is, it's not this big scary thing. It's just kind of following your heart. It's like following your passion and when people realize that's all that entrepreneurship is, they're like, oh, I can do that. And I feel like there's this big thing that entrepreneur is this like sexy thing that only certain white boys from college dropouts from messed up families can go do. <laughs> and which I've heard VCs say this at conferences. They will say, this is what an entrepreneur is. You, oh, single white guy drop college dropout from messed up families. And they use four examples to generalize across the population. Like, you're, I'm like, way to perpetuate self-fulfilling prophecy crap. Like, stop that. Like, um, it's not. Like, there's entre it's, it's women, it's men, it's black, it's white. It's like, if you look, look around, it's anybody who's trying to hustle and make something happen. That's the entrepreneur. And I think if we just acknowledge that and honor that, then it won't feel so scary. And then people will kind of lean in more and figure it out and more problems will get solved. The second question you asked was, what's the headline? Um, I mean, we're doing a huge endeavor this year around getting more, um, kind of in this vein, getting more women into entrepreneurship. We're launching this big campaign next week or something. Um, and so I want to be able to prove that women are, I mean, we do kind of prove it in that some of our stats show that women are just as successful. but. I just want to kind of really show that. And I want a year or two from now to be like, yeah, Indiegogo is really changing the face of entrepreneurship and making it accessible to everybody. See, all kinds of people are, um, are doing it. Even people who have crazy ideas like cat ears, you know, are proving the world wrong. Not the world wrong. They're proving the world right because it's the world voting for them, but they're proving the like gatekeepers of the world <laughs> who's now their job is I mean, if you ask most gatekeepers, it's not like they got into the business to be gatekeepers. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, I want to be a gatekeeper. No, they got into the business because they wanted to like help ideas. But until Indiegogo came along, the whole system of getting ideas off the ground was super inefficient, riddled with bias, super high risk, and forced them to kind of, you know, lean on biases and, and things like that to make decisions. And with Indiegogo, we create markets before they actually exist. When people vote with their dollar, they're telling you, I want this thing. So it's the most fair, egalitarian thing that you can get. Um, and that's why we're kind of de-risking the whole finance thing. And that's why VCs are now like thanking us because we're actually a pipeline for them. And they're getting access to cool things like cat earphones that they probably would have said no to. They're like, oops, I clearly would have messed that one up. Mm -hmm. so. so I think we have time for just two more questions, please. Thank you for this talk and your answer to the previous questions were actually a, it's a good segue to what I was thinking about. Um, in my previous, in my job prior to Haas, I worked with social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. at mid-stage organizations uh, and we saw a lack of diversity in the, entre the entrepreneurs mm. who uh, had made it to that mid-stage. Mid mm -hmm. And we were having a lot of conversations around exactly what you're talking about. How do we change the definition of entrepreneurship? And also, how do we think about fixing the pipeline um, at the various stages where mm -hmm. it's leaky? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you just answered a little bit of my question, which is, how are you all thinking about um, the, that type of conversation that I was mm -hmm. having in my last job? But mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little more specifically, so this headline that you uh, would like to see next year, what is Indiegogo doing right now to change people's self-perception um, of themselves as, themselves as entrepreneurs and to get more people using the site who wouldn't, um, who, who wouldn't otherwise think of themselves as people, not just as entrepreneurs, but even as people who could start an Indiegogo campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing is this campaign, a specific campaign saying entrepreneurship is for everybody. Women join in. Um, and I think tactically it's going to, it's a lot of, we're finally investing, thank God, more into um, like content marketing, which is just storytelling. It's just showing. I mean, so much of what I've learned is that I mean, I know it's a cliche quote, but you can't be what you can't see. And by just sharing all the stories that, I mean, I shared like six today, right? So oh, that's me, I'm gonna I'll go off of that. But um, the more we share those stories, the more people feel like, oh, this is for me. 
I still get the question today. I'm like, can I use Indiegogo for X? And I'm like, we still haven't told people that like, it's not, we're not deciding. We're, you don't have to ask us for permission. <laughs> um, but still the world feels that way. Like they need to, to co get a permission from the partner that they're working with to go. And I feel like um, if we just show as much diversity that's happening of campaigners from all walks of life, all types of projects, and we show it in a, how they're all united in their entrepreneurship, then I think that'll start to get that. So we're doing a lot around the marketing stuff. Um, and I think we're actually digging into our data right now to see if there's any data more that we can use cause, to show that, because that's what, um, nothing tells a story better than data. I mean, you have to tell the story too, but it kind of validates that story is when you have the data. So we're actually looking at all that right now. Um, and I actually did hire a team of Haas consultants two or three years ago now to help us with this project. Um, but we were also in, in the mode of, okay, got to do what's, what's the most important thing right now. And like, you know, I, I don't know, I think our customer happiness ticketing system wasn't working right now. So like, it kind of like bare burnt fires to burn and we had to like fix that first or, so, um, but I think that's, that's where we're going with it. And last question. Well, Denise, I mean, there, there's so many ideas in, in what you presented, that idea of funding for profit versus funding for purpose, just a, mm -hmm. a huge center of gravity and, mm -hmm. and helping to change the way people think. There was one phrase you used that stuck for me. I'm sure we all have different, different, uh, different points of your talk that were, that were especially meaningful to us. But when you talked about ideas going unborn, right? Super powerful. How many medical problems never, drugs never got invented yeah. because lack of funding? How yeah. many, yeah, like yeah. how many local coffee shops in your neighbor, neighborhood never got built? <laughs> uh, absolutely. A and then I, you know? at least for me, that when you talked about the, the starting point of a culture is what mm -hmm. makes you want to come in in the morning or excited mm -hmm. to be come in in the morning. That is, um, as opposed to saying it is time to write down our core values. That's a terrific motivator. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danae. We Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so come back and see these, these next two talks as well. <laughs>